Hi, I'm Russell Wu, a third year SPS student here in the University of York. And today I have with me Professor Held from the University of Durham. Uh, professor Held, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm David Held. I'm a professor of politics and international relations at the University of Durham mm -hmm. and also master of University College, which is the oldest college of Durham University. And uh, what will you be talking about today? Well, my title is quite a sort of big one. It's called uh, Gridlock, Why Global Cooperation is Failing When We Need It Most. And uh, this is a title after my last book of the same title. And uh, I came to this book, to came to write this book or to think about this book because I went to a lot of lectures after the climate negotiations in Copenhagen failed some years ago. And everyone was scrambling for an explanation of why, when people know what the problem is, and they know approximately what to do, they don't do it. So, and people were trying to find an explanation for the failure of climate negotiations internal to those negotiations themselves. But the more I thought about it, the more I began to think, actually the explanation of why climate negotiations fail has probably little to do with climate negotiations themselves, has actually to do with broader structures and broader processes that would explain not only why climate negotiations trade fail, but why trade negotiations are failing, why security negotiations are failing, for instance, over Syria. We all know that what's happening in Syria is a calamity. There's you know, over 250,000 people now dead, 5 million people displaced, and we're still looking at it. We're still watching, waiting for something to happen that might alleviate the situation. In other words, nothing. So I came to write Gridlock as an attempt to try and understand why is it that we've reached a point in time where global cooperation is failing. Now the academic point I want to make is this, is that most of political science and the social sciences in the last 30 years have been concerned to explain why states that might be self-interested cooperate. Some big names like Bob Cohen have written about this. But I wanted to turn that question on its head and ask almost for the first time in 30 years, why don't they? You know, why don't they cooperate? And to try and explain that. So that's what the talk is about. Okay. And how is this uh, important for future generation to understand this topic? Well, I mean, in a way, it's self-evident because if you, if climate change continues to develop at the pace it is now, with global warming across large parts of the planet, increasingly erratic weather patterns, the melting of the uh, great ice masses in the North and South Poles, life as we know it will slowly change. It is already changing in some places. This um, year in the UK is the warmest, now we now know is the warmest year on record. We've had six of the warmest summers on record in the last 10 years, six of the mildest winters in the last 10 years ever. And that's not just about the UK, that's a much bigger picture. So if we don't find a way of addressing climate change, we will slowly change the nature of human life itself for future generations, perhaps just your children's generation, that's as far as we need to go. You, probably, but also your children's generation. And what goes for this also goes for trade, financial market instability, huge poverty across the world, great inequality, and the gradually the opting out of the wealthy from the social order itself because they can always buy themselves out. They can live nowhere. They can live everywhere and nowhere. So we have a situation that needs thinking about and explaining because these large transborder issues, or I call them global collective action problems, have consequences for our life chances, ours, others across the world. And so they're very urgent, and trying to explain why we are not addressing them satisfactorily is very urgent in order to understand the process. The trouble is, of course, even understanding the process won't necessarily help you attain impact in the British social science sense, in the British government sense, because it's hard to change institutional structures. It's hard to change the way people think. It's hard to change cultures. We have about 30 to 50 years on climate change to get it right, if that, maximum. And it's hard to change who we are, how we consume the nature of our institutions, the nature of our economy which is always growth-oriented as opposed to, let's say, stability-oriented. So these are big issues about our lives, our future, and so this lecture is about something I think myself is very important, although, of course, that's up for others to judge as well. Thank you very much.